We are in Revelation chapter 16, and uh, you know I've been joking about it for the last couple of weeks, but when Silas and I were having conversation, he's like, hey, what chapter are you going to be in? Is there some, um, you know, maybe there's some songs that fit that chapter? And I said, well, we're going to be in the seven bowl judgments of Revelation. So yeah, if you can figure out a uh, worship songs that go with that, you know what, I think you got it. I think you picked the songs that go because, you know, there's just a God. I know we're going to read stuff that's going to be heavy, but all through it, God's speaking to us. All through it, he speaks to his church. You know, we we may have forgot it because I think we're 10 months. We're, we've crossed over the 10-month mark or something like this. We'll well be a year in this book, and um, and we can forget chapters 2 and 3. We can forget chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I, I want to reveal my heart to you. And he's going to reveal his holiness, chapters 2 and 3, the written to the church. And, and he still speaks to the church today. And even though we're going to have seven bowl judgments uh, that we're going to read, every one of these bowls, God would speak something very specific to us that ministers to our heart and encourages us to for what we have before us today. And so... Um, John's on the island of Patmos. Write the things which... You've seen Revelation 1, the things which are, the seven churches, chapter 2 and 3, and now the things which will take place, and that's where we are today. Um, We're beyond the mid-tribulation point, and God doesn't give us prophecy to scare us or to put us into fear, and we'll talk about that before we finish us today, but he brings a peace. Hey, you know what? The world's not falling apart. It's literally falling right in place. What we're going to read today, these seven bowls, they're a culmination of the heart of man and the history of man. I can read these seven bowls and I see the heart of man and I go, man, I'm reading this on the news. You know, we do a prophecy update every month at the end of the month for a reason that we go to keep us prepared that, hey, this, these things, they're unfolding before us. And again, it's not falling apart. It's falling right in place, just as the Lord says, but it brings us a peace, but it sets us a priority, what's really important. And we'll be talking about that, and we'll, there's a purity. Lord, may you find a spotless bride. And But this Bible is truly inspired as we're going to read the things and see how perfect they align, that the writer couldn't have made this up other than under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so, and it gives us a heart to tell the world, Jesus Christ is alive and he's coming. And so, Father, as I, we look at these, uh, Lord, they don't bring us into fear. Would you show us um, who you are, God, how great you are? And here we see when you speak, it's done. And Lord, what do you think of us? You speak to us. You th- would say, I love you. I've rescued you. I offer you an intimacy. And we'll read that today. And Lord, what do you want us to do as we look at these things? They're more than information. There's a calling for us. And what can we boldly request? Because we see the great I am, the becoming one who can speak these things and they happen. What is your need today, church? What is your need today, Christian? What is your need in your marriage? What's your need in your personal relationship with Christ? What's your victory that you need to have? And what thing might the devil be coming against you? And so, Lord, what do we need to be on guard of as we watch the, the evil one in his way still kill and destroy? But you've come that we may have life and that more abundance. So let your word come alive, I pray. In your name, amen. Well, we're going to start with, and I'm going to purposely cover this whole chapter I surely don't want to do seven weeks of seven bowls. I surely don't want to do two weeks of seven bowls. Um, So we will take it at a little higher level. And the first one I start with is just starts off rough. The loathsome source, just the word loathsome. I almost don't even need to give a description. It will actually say foul and loathsome. But let's start with verse 1. Well, let's start in verse 8 of chapter 15 where we ended because this is vital for the understanding, especially anyone maybe you don't know Jesus Christ personally today. And you can say why. This doesn't seem fair. Verse 8 ended, The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. 
Verse 1, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of wrath on God, of God on the earth. So as we studied, and I think what we'll see here as we read this is quick su- succession. Some people think this is three and a half years. Uh, when we read it, there just doesn't seem to be the ability that you could sustain. We're going to read there's no water, the air is going to be choking, hard to breathe, and hail, and these type of things. And so I think it's going to be quick succession. I think we're going to see the, the things coming to the end. In fact, Matthew 24, the, Jesus would say, unless these days were cut short, no one would live and survive. So uh, I think they'll be cut short because what we see here as coming. But for the context, last week we studied why, and that study's online. It's the holiness of God. And the holiness of God requires holiness. And the creation and a rebellion needs to be corrected. And as we studied the book of Revelation, it's a dispossessing. God's taking back the land, just like the children of Israel. When they came into the promised land, they dispossessed those who had taken possession of it. It took seven years, and interesting, when you read this, here we are, it's going to be about seven years. But God is going to take back this earth. We'll be studying here in a few weeks the millennial kingdom as he starts this um, dispossessing, driving the rebellion out and starting this thousand-year reign of Christ, and we'll be reigning with him and the fascination of it. But I like what my, um, my one friend, uh, Sandy Adams, he says, you know, you go to a hockey game, and sometimes we joke, I grew up in western Pennsylvania, so hockey was very big to us there in Pittsburgh, and, uh, but we would have our joke, you know, man, um, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. Because, you know, it was like back in the 70s, 80s, all there was was a fight after a fight. They didn't even play the game. And um, now a little less than so. But one thing we always saw in those hockey games, you know, is teeth up to the glove to pull that glove off. And they pulled them and they ripped those gloves down because gloves are off. That's where the saying came from. And this is really the Lord's coming. He's going to judge the Antichrist. He's going to judge the false prophet. He's judging the devil. And the gloves are off. And this is where we're going to go. It's full on. Jesus Christ is bringing these things because of his righteousness. We'll have an interlude. Even though, again, we just went through chapter 15, we're going to see halfway through it's still going to be an angel coming to give it because you're just and holy. Are you, Lord? Holiness. And so we start with these gloves are off. And now we come to... The first um, bowl, so the first went, verse 2, and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Just the word foul and loathsome. I started to teach this as I was teaching it this morning in the first service. I looked at my wife, and she was just like, giving me that look like, are you really going to say, well, it's what the scripture says, but foul and loathsome. It's what it says, so I'm just going to let it speak for itself. But if you've ever been there and you've ever had a wound that won't heal, and I got some of those wounds from like road rash going down, you know, on the road or in the sports injury, and they're the hardest ones to heal, it seems. And there can be a place, and I'm just It's what it says. So it's foul. It actually comes with a smell. A loathsome just is this loathing. It just won't stop. And the Lord separates these sores. Exodus 9, we saw this, that it was the sixth plague that sores came. But just like in Exodus, for the Exodus of the children of Israel into the promised land, here we see. Once again, it's a differentiating that those who have the mark of the beast take his image and worship him. The sword comes upon them. Those that don't are not touched. And so here the Lord is dividing these things when the gloves are coming off. And as I said, every one of these still comes with a witness. But it makes me... Last night, you know, this scorching heat that we're having. Then in the evening, the humidity comes. And, man, I took the puppy out, you know, before we called it a night. And I don't think I was out there five minutes. 
And I come back, and it was an hour before my body calmed down because I must have had 50 of these mosquito bites and no see bites. And I've been in the backcountry woods hunting and, and, and the likes and didn't do what I should have marked myself with that, you know, that spray. I didn't. I go in just, you know, all happy about life. Then the next day I wake up and literally my whole body's on fire because the no see just, they love me and they just eat me and they destroy me. And my point that I make about that is, as I build on it, this is the first sword. These people are going to live with this for whatever this succession is. But um, I remember when it happened, I didn't sleep. This is true. And you might have, I was still here teaching. Uh, it was just last year, the year before. I didn't sleep for a week because my body could not sleep because the pain was so serious. These are just the little noceum bugs, we call them, biting my body. My friend had it last year. He had to go get steroid shots. And so here you are, the, the pain and agonizing upon your body, but there's still a witness. And, and, and the beauty of the witnesses is still that's going to be here that we're reading here is man sows, reaping and sowing. And yeah, we always take it on the negative. And could you just take this, Christian? We always talk about reaping and sowing, and we always put it on the negative, and we are reading the negative consequence of sowing into rebellion and dis disobedience to the word of God. And so they're reaping what they're sowing. But you know, there's a spiritual application here. It's a spiritual law that cannot be undone ever. And so you know what we come, there's a spiritual law for us. You reap what you sow and you sow in the spiritual things of the Lord. You will reap the deep spiritual things of the Lord. There's a witness that's being spoken of that the world can look because there's still people at this point who haven't taken the mark. And they're going to look and they're going to go, man, I can di clearly differentiate everyone who has the mark. This is the agony, the no see their bodies on fire. It's a loathsome, foul smell. Those of us that haven't taken, we still, we have not been touched by that. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God's not mocked for whatever man sows that he will reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And here's a word for us as believers, and God speaks a word. But he who sows to the Spirit will, of the Spirit, reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't, don't lose heart. Look, I know it's long. Uh, this chapter is going to be long. The book of Revelation is starting to feel long. And I told you when we began, I go, you know, about halfway through, you're going to go, what's up with the pastor? And I, I told you, I start getting tired when I teach this book because it starts becoming very tiring when you come into this tribulation and that's all you keep talking about. Yet all the way through, we still keep coming. We see grace. We're going to see grace today. We see grace. We see a God of love. We see all of these goodness. And I just want to say, don't grow weary. And maybe things seem long for you, whatever you're going through. Don't grow weary. Keep reaping what you're sowing. Keep sowing the things of the Spirit into your marriage. Keep sowing the things of the Spirit into your relationships with your children, with your parents, with the ministries God has given you. Because there is a place that we're going to come and we're going to hear, well done. You made it. You're going to stand before my glory because you did not grow weary. In verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. And I think there's a place we just go, okay, Lord, what's the opportunity you put before me? Is it helping in VBS? Is it serving somewhere, whatever it may be, but it's worth the investment. And so here's the differentiating that we see here. And the second one, bowl two, Verse 3, the seas turn to blood. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. 
Every living creature in the sea died. We saw this blood, uh, the seas turned to blood. We saw the rivers, Exodus 7. We continually see a replication and what we're seeing is a compounding here. But it means what it says, the rivers, the seas, excuse me, turned to blood as a dead man. And just if foul and loathsome isn't hard enough, uh, dead men it's a coagulating blood it starts you know it's not like this wave of the sea that's happening and it keeps moving it's, it's going to literally start it's going to be this thickness of blood and yeah once again we go wow that's that's a pretty heavy stuff that we're talking of all it says and every living creature in the sea died you got to understand famine is amplified because we've been reading things of, you know, famines that are happening, can't buy or sell without a mark. Well, now you start every sea creature's dead. Now the famine even exasperates itself even more. When I lived in Florida, I lived on the um, beach side there um, several, many years ago. And there was this thing when you would have this red tide, and I don't believe this is red tide at all. It says what it means. In the Greek, it literally means blood, doesn't was like blood no it literally means blood as dead men a thick blood a a starting to dry type blood but when i was in florida and and you had this uh red tide and not all the animals sea creatures would die but thousands of fish would wash up and the point that i make just amplifying what this scene and the situation is like as we look at these things you could smell the stench of dead sea living dead sea creatures from a mile away and then it became thickening in the air that it was actually becoming hard to breathe because of the stench that would come this is what the environment is that we have here and anyone that again uh, speak to maybe there's a person here today you think when i see these things then i'll get right i don't think it will even You'll be gasping for air, trying to figure out how to get a drink of water and how to get a bite to eat. Today's the day of salvation, not some other time as we look and see these things. But one of the things that's going to happen, and we don't put into, as we see it in, in its biggest picture, is that... So we, we read in Revelation 8, we read of the first trump, a th- third of the trees are dead now. Then the second trump, a third of the sea life. Well, now we're at 100%, period. So in one third, when we were back in chapter 8, it was grace. I'm still giving you time to change and repent. And God keeps sending this message. He's sending out two witnesses at a, at a wall to preach the everlasting gospel. The second half of this tribulation period, everlasting angel preaching the gospel. 144,000 sealed of Christ. Doesn't say they're going to be Billy Grahams, but I tell you what, you get sealed of Christ in the tribulation period. I bet you you're preaching Christ and you're telling people, man, look what he's done for me. And yet there still be a world that's rejecting these things. Well, now gloves are off. It's 100%. We're down to weeks of life left on this planet because these things have to be quick secession. They can't go on forever because now when you take that a third of the trees were wiped out and the grass were wiped out, now you're going 100%. The sea's dead. That means all the air, and I, I forget what they say some say it's 50 percent my my and now my studies take it 20 percent of the of the air that we breathe comes from the oceans through plankton so now we have this massive uh air problem and now people are going to be gasping for air and you know as every one of these bowls i look at they still speak there's a world today they're suffocated and maybe it's you today you're suffocated with oppression. You're suffocated with depression. You're suffocated with anxiety. You're suffocated with all the environment that the world is thrown at you spiritually. And here we are. We have the breath of life. When Paul says, I love Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, follow me as I follow Christ. What a, what a calling we have. We get to say, follow me as I follow Christ. As, as we'll say, that we're living epistles known and read. Many people are not even going to open the Bible, but they look at our lives and they go, what's different about this? But I look and I see just something in, we have the breath 
of God. We're not just living epistles. We're walking tabernacles. Do you not know that you are the tabernacle of God and that God lives in us? We get to take into a world that's oppressed, suffocating, and we get to take in the breath of God. And there's a calling as we reap and we sow and we sow. And God's like, would you take me over there? I must talk to that person. And we're going to talk about, we don't have to complicate it. We don't have to burden, overburden ourselves. I don't know what to say. I'm not an evangelist. And these gods are just, just take me. Take me fresh wind, fresh fire, breathe fresh air into this person's life. They're suffocating because of the world around them. But maybe that's you right now, and there's a breath of air that God would speak to you. He wants to bring refreshing through the Spirit and His presence of God. And we'll worship more at the end, and you'll get an opportunity to just let the breath and air of God breathe over you through worship right now, through the Word. Well, the third bowl is fresh waters turned into blood. So now there's no seawater that could even possibly be desalinated. Now we're going to come into this next um, verse 4 through 7 as we read here. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Well, we saw this. It was the third trumpet when we were studying. Now here we go. It's 100% this time. The third trumpet, wormwood came, made the waters bitter. There was recovery. Maybe man started to think, okay, you know, that was just a passing thing. It's, it's not what we think it is. You know, the Antichrist is not that he'll call himself that. Um, but he's got us through this. He's able to, well, now we're coming to 100%, gloves off. There's going to be nothing here that is, is going to be any doubt, and God's going to start squeezing these things down. And so now you've got all the waters of the, of the world. So what does that bring you to? It brings you to what? Only what's left in water holding tanks, only what's left in um, gallons of water, only what's left in, in bottled water. You can see how things are starting to narrow down very quickly as we see this. But then in the middle of it all, thankfully we get to take a break right now because, wow, foul sores, thanks, that was great. I really love to hear that on Sunday morning. And now loathsome sores and dead rivers and dead seas and just in the middle of it again once again here's an interlude of the lord verse five through seven and i heard an angel of the water saying you are righteous O lord the one who is and who was and who is to be because you've judged these things for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you've given them the blood of blood to drink for it is their just due and I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord, God Almighty, true and justice are your judgments. You remember, and here's things changing. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Hey, you heard an eye for an eye, but now I tell you, turn the other cheek. I tell you, and, and he goes on, but I tell you to re not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And here's the strength of the Lord that he's going to speak just and true in my ways. You took the blood of the saints. You took the blood of the prophets. God is speaking. This is the culmination, revelation of the culmination of all of man. A climax is happening here as we're watching the end of this tribulation period. But God says, I'm bringing judgment to all the wrong on this earth. You killed the prophets. You killed, you killed all the messengers that I sent, Old Testament, now even into modern-day prophets that he would speak. And a modern-day prophet just speaks the word of God just says this is what's coming and they're not ashamed of it and they're not afraid to say this is what's all the blood that you took in the womb on these tables all the word that i'll speak to any political party or any politician who wants to say it's okay to take the life of of the baby in the womb god says it's blood for blood now and he's going to come and he's bringing these things together and many people can come and say you know what's the fairness god how can this be fair You know it's not fair. That God would send his only begotten son. 
perfect spotless, the love of his life. And he who knew no sin to become sin for us. That he would die for us and say, this is the way. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You, I'll trade places with you. And people can say, God's not fair. That's the first place I go. You want to talk unfairness? There's what's unfair. God is coming. The angel's inter interjecting right here in the middle of these bowls, just about halfway through, saying, just and true, Lord, everything that you're doing has a justice behind it. I'm reminded I love baseball and uh, especially as a young youngster playing baseball when I was growing up and those type of things and I uh, read old baseball stories and one of them was an umpire at the time of Babe Ruth I wasn't there for Babe Ruth just so everybody I'm not that old um, I had to read the story but uh, his name was uh, Babe Pinelli just interesting and he was umpiring a baseball game Babe Ruth the great was playing and 40,000 people there in New York and um, the pitch count came and it was he called strike three you're out and 40,000 people booed and Babe Ruth turned to Babe Pinella and says it's under the opinion of 40,000 people that that was a ball and umpire Pinella said to the great Babe Ruth, the only opinion that matters in this place is mine. Take a seat. And there is a place that we look, the only opinion that matters is the opinion and the word of God that is sure and it's true. But there's a power here again as we look because the world will say, Lord, I don't understand. Even as Christians, we can read this and go, man, this is hard foul and loathsome. Oh, bloods. They're, they're, what's the drink? Oh, you don't even have fresh water to clean your sore just to amplify how painful that is. Yes, that's what we, the word is speaking here. And as we look at these things and we go, Lord, this is hard. But I love it. In the midst of what's happening on the earth, there's an echo and a breakthrough from heaven. And heaven will speak to earth that could be going man this is hard this is heavy and there's a word that comes out of the heavens that says just and true what you do is right and you know there's an application for every one of us when I sit and I put myself into my situation on this earth and I start looking at things that might be happening that I start going I don't understand this I don't understand why this is happening. I thought I did this well. Or, Lord, I thought I asked for you to forgive me of this. I thought you would have showed up by now and, and stepped into these places. And I can start questioning and asking, Lord, where are you? What, what's going on here? But then when I find myself that I step back, head up, and just sit in the heavenlies and just sit before his throne, worship him in spirit and truth, just let the word be the word of God. I'll say I find this in my life, and you will too, and I'm sure many of you have been there. I'll say I'm not asking what's fair. I'm not asking the whys. I'm actually sitting there and going, just and true your ways, Lord. And great and marvelous, as we studied, great and marvelous are your ways, Lord God Almighty. You know, there's a way about Jesus. It's just a way about him. It's beautiful. There's a way about him that he walks among us and he touches us, calls us away into a place of intimacy. There's a way about him that when we sit, we just go, Lord, you're beautiful, your ways. There's just a way about you that's unlike anything in this world. But of course, if I get too embedded in what's happening in my world down here, I'll lose the ways of the Lord. When I step up into the heavenlies, I go, oh, beautiful are your ways. Then I can step back into those beautiful things of he who knew no sin, that you would do that for me. Well, the next bowl, bowl four, the sun scorches the earth, verses eight and nine. So now consider this. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. That's a fascinating thing that we sit here. The sun scorches, and 
the burning upon the men that we see here. And even in all this pain, the loathsome sores. Now, they don't have the ability to repent unto salvation, but they do have the ability to recognize and give God glory. And yet even in all of it, they'll go, I won't. So much into where they are, they still won't give them glory. There's no atheist at this point. No atheist. They know who's on the throne. They know where this is coming from, and yet they still don't give him glory as we look at these things. You know, um, people say, if I just had a sign, then I would believe. That's what the Pharisees said. Some then, Matthew 12, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will it be given to except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh Nineveh, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed greater than Jonah is here. You know, people will say, maybe it's you here today. Maybe you're listening on the radio. Maybe it's on the live stream. Maybe it's some podcast that comes across. And you go, if God will just give me a sign, what I will say to you, these people at this time are getting the greatest signs and yet they still won't repent and there's an application for us as ministers of the gospel of jesus christ as all of us are called to and the beautiful thing is we'll never fear someone into the kingdom i know hellfire and brimstone preaching and we're we're preaching the fact of what it is but what that is to to present is the is the holiness of god so it can expound the love of god This is how much God loves you. The sign that he gives you gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes him shall not perish and have everlasting life. I don't think we'll ever get someone to come to the gospel and receive Jesus because they're afraid. And and I think about it. Could you imagine if this was my proposal to my wife, Renee? Renee, if you don't marry me, you're going to end up marrying some loser. He's going to be poor. He's going to be bankrupt. He might be brutal he might just be arrogant and ignorant and that's why you need to marry me because you might end up marrying a loser now as true as all those things may be i think she would say i'll take my chances and not i don't fully but then i come and i say you ravish my heart above all others would you let me love you cherish you serve you and give and pour my life out for you because that's where my heart is that I love you and that's what the Lord says to you I'm not trying to fear you in to this but I, you ravish my heart as the song of Solomon says would you let me love you and cherish you I will love you to the point of death that God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me take your wrath. Let me put you under the shadow of my wings and just show you the depths of my love. I will take the sin that was due you and I will take it so that you can take the position as a son or a daughter. And that's what the gospel is. And that's the gospel that we share and tell people. There's a God that loves you, wants a personal relationship And he's holy. You'll never know the degree of God's love until you know the degree of God's holiness. And we're reading it here in chapters 15 and 16. And when we see that God says, this is what I must bring for those who break my holy law. And then we go, that was me. And now I see that you're willing to take on the very things that you despise. That's love. That's amazing love. And it's amazing grace. Well, Number five, darkness upon the earth, verses 10 and 11. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. 
and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores and did not repent of their deed. They're gnawing their tongues, the pain that they're in. It's not just the darkness, it's all these loathsome sores. It's all these things coming upon them, and yet they still can't say anything with these tongues, even though they can't speak. I got stung by a wasp a couple of months ago on my tongue. I was just minding my own business with my big stick pulling down their hive. Should have had a mask. Should have had gloves. Got me on the hand, got me on the tongue, and then I was talking like this for about three hours. And it makes me think, man, they're not even going to be able to speak. And yet what they can muster with their tongue will be a curse rather than he is holy. He is God Almighty. And so they, they come to this place and they're going to be in this darkness. Josephus is a Roman historian. He's not a believer by any means in Christ, but he, Rome, loved their record keeping. So Rome, since they had possession over all of Israel at the time, they said, start writing the history of this nation, these people. They would do it for all the other nations that they conquered. Well, here we are today. We go to work, we come home. What do we do? We eat together. Maybe watch a little television, see what's going on on social media and those type of things if, if you're into those type of things. Well, in, in that time, you didn't have that. You'd go work at Gary and Culture. You would be out in the fields working. You would come in at dark because you'd use every minute of light that you would have, and then you would sit, and then you would have your family meal, and then there was what? There was nothing else except the Father, because the Jewish people love to tell stories. Here we are with one of the greatest stories. And they would tell the history orally. It's called the oral tradition. And they would tell the history of the nation of Israel. They would also tell the oral law, the Ten Commandments, all 613. And the father would be responsible to know that. So dad, lot, lots on your plate to, to teach your kids. And they would share these oral stories. So Josephus... In, trusted uh he would write the history of the jewish people and so he would interview tell me your jewish tell me your oral traditions your stories and he would take from the tr oral traditions that were passed down that the oral spoken that the dads would share at the dinner table was our forefather my dad's dad's dad all the way back said that when that darkness came upon egypt that it was so dark that you couldn't breathe. It's something that we just can't imagine. I've been in depths of caves and the types and the darkness. You feel like you can wear it. You're like, man, I, I feel the darkness upon me. But here, this darkness, he says, you, you couldn't even breathe. So there was some type of oppression that came with the darkness that however this comes to be in, in the part, and, and here's what the Lord's doing for them. You love darkness, I'll give you darkness. John three sixteen through 21, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever should believe and shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But verses 19 says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And so here we come to this place that the darkness, you love darkness, I'll give you darkness. And it's so oppressing that it gnaws at their teeth. I think they start to realize where they are and the pains that come. And it is because our brother Paul tells us, I believe, Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one, this is the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, which he will become demon-possessed. 
this Antichrist, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So he's doing all these signs, and now God, the king of glory, he's going to like, I want to crush and wipe out all your signs and wonders and show who the one true sign and wonder and king is. It's going to be me, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And here's the darkness. The lie. What is the lie that Paul speaks of? We call it expositional constancy. You go back and go, well, where was the first mention of a lie? And then you can use that as biblical constancy through your Bible studies. Where's the first mention of the lie? We know it. It was back in the garden. And what was the lie? Did God really say that? What was the lie? God's keeping something from you. God's not fair. And so here they are. They love their lie because they love their sin. And I don't want to go too deep on it, but when you watch people who rally behind people who are clearly like, this is just carnal immorality. Why are people rallying around this group of people? It's because they love their darkness. You present and hold what I love. And I don't want to repent. And so all of us will be in this together and we watch it through the political systems of all the nations of the world, through the history of mankind. But the lie that we can look at and the lie that we speak of, don't believe it. God wants to speak a lie to you that he's keeping something from you. If God gave his only begotten son, then what could he possibly ever keep from you? If I gave you everything, my greatest love and treasure, why would you ever think that I would keep and limit anything else? If I gave you my greatest, then surely I'll continue to give you all. But I'll give you what's best for you and what's best to keep you where in in these things. So the lie, they fall for it. They love their darkness, rather, so they don't have to repent. Well, as we move to the sixth bowl, So thankful we're not doing seven weeks of seven bowls. Verses 12 through 16, the river Euphrates. Fascinating. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. We know that's the devil from our study. Out of the mouth of the beast, that's this antichrist, the lawless one, the son of perdition. And out of the mouth of the false prophet who we studied who will point and say, follow him. He is, at some point he'll come, he is God. Verse 14, and they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming. Words in red, if that's your um, version of a Bible. Words in red, words of Christ. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Least he walks naked and they see his shame and they gathered them together together the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. This is the only place you'll hear the word Armageddon. Everywhere else, uh, as we read these things, it speaks of the Valley of Megiddo and these type of things. Um, Napoleon, when he came to here, and I'll spend more time on this when I get to chapter 19, so um, I won't go too much, but I do want to make, there's a great application. Uh, Napoleon, when he came here, he goes, man, this is the greatest. I would love to fight a battle. Napoleon was so disappointed that he didn't get to fight all the fights that he wanted. But it's just this massive mounting. If you've been to Israel and some of you have, there's like 33 um, generations of battles that have been fought here. And we see, uh, we've read about some of them here through there, Jabin and 900 chariots were overwhelmed. Gideon, this is where he defeated the Midianites. So if you start piecing, this is where the battles are. And uh, Samson triumphed over the Philistines. Barak and Deborah defeated Sisera. Saul was slain by the Philistines. Ahazai slain by arrows of Jehu. Pharaoh Necho slew King Josiah. And then it the, goes on and on. And so this is the biblical. This is one of the great battlefields of the world that we look at and we see through here. 
uh, this great. But for the kings of the east to come to fight the king, the, it's like the, the land bridge between Europe and Asia. And that's why it becomes such a battlefield because this is the great place to, to fight. So the kings of the east are going to come and they're going to fight the Antichrist and his forces. We'll study this more deeper when we get to chapter 19. And he's going to be coming from right above Jerusalem and he's going to come and move in and this is where this battle's going to be. And the Lord's going to give him what he wants. And that's what I always say about uh, sometimes God gives you what you vote for. So United States of America, be on guard. He'll give you what you vote for. This is what the people want. They want to come. They want to fight. And what's going to happen here? There's a place where the kings of the east go, you know, we were following you. You, you seem like the man of the hour, and you were doing great things. But now we see you're a your tyrant. You're a bully. We're done with you. You're not providing for us. You can't solve any of these problems. We're rising up, and we're going to come and defeat you. Well, he's going to get word of that, and he's going to come, and let's go. Let's battle this out. And it's amazing to me when I think about this is, why would the devil want to go to the war with the same people that, you know, are like-minded with? They're, they have the mark. They rejected Christ. Why would he want to bring this battle and, and go to war against them? And I'll tell you why. Because the kings of the east are going to come and they're going to pose a threat to the devil's kingdom. His kingdom is under this revived Roman Empire as we studied. And he's going to come and they, they're going to bring a threat to him. And Satan has this. And there's an application for you and for me. He will come to steal, kill, and destroy anyone, anything that poses a threat to him. And so if you wonder why you feel your life, the oppression you find, it's like, man, every day there's this continual warfare that I'm under. Praise the Lord. What? Yeah, praise the Lord, because the devil considers you a threat. And he will come and he will do his battle against you. And he wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy. Even the kings of the east and the mighty army that they are. Some think, well, he, the devil wants to draw him because he knows Jesus returns and they're going to fight together. I don't, I don't think so. I think the devil just comes upon those that threat. But I say this for an application for us. This great Euphrates River. It's about 1,800 miles long. It's about three to 1,200 miles wide, or yards, excuse me, and uh, it's 10 to 30 feet deep. Well, so it needs to dry up so that they can come through. But you go, wow, scorching sun, how is there, you know, floods? Well, it's because the scorching sun is going to melt all the polar caps. And so there's going to be this... Uh, rise in water here and, and the Lord will give them what they want so they can come and they can have their battle together against one another but here's the point that I want to make and it's a point that I always look at myself Genesis fifteen seventeen through 21 and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark and that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given you this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. That river is running through Iraq. That map that I draw out to you, you know, the lie, and we talked about this dispelling uh, in our prophecy update, you know, this anti-Semitism. You know why, and, and again, why does Satan want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth? Because he wants to wipe out any memory of what happened there 2,000 years ago. And that's what the river to the sea. But the river they speak about is the Jordan River. That's on the West Bank, they call. That is pales. Because you can see my map. You can see the little thing of Israel. It's the size of New Jersey. God had given Abraham, the Jewish people, all the way to the great river Euphrates, all the way over there in Iraq, and all the way over to this great, the, this, um, the great river of Egypt that we see here. And here's the point that I make, and it's really for all of us, because we can miss it and not even realize it. Israel paled and scratched all that the Lord had given them. They never fully took all that was promised to them. And even still to this day, the best they took is what we see here today. And we can look and we say, that's, that's sad. You never took all that God promised you. And I love what the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 says, 
not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not commit myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love the forgetting the things of the past. He's talking about all of his failures. I was religious, I was this, I martyred, I persecuted. And he goes, I'm not going to let my past failings keep me from reaching. And you know what? God saved me, and that's not enough. I'm not going to be content that God just saved me. And some people, and too often, we just go, I'm saved, I'm happy, I'll be in heaven. And yet God says, I have so much greatness for you. And when you expand your territory, and the prayer of Jabez is beautiful, First Chronicles 4, and Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, and there's a, a feeling, oh, that you would bless me indeed. It, it, it's a emphatic of bless me doubly, bless me greatly. And here's what he asked for, enlarge my territory. People want to go prosperity. He's preaching at a time where they have not taken the land. And then he goes, that your hand would be upon me. That's the presence of the Lord. That you would keep me from evil. That's the devil in his ways. Um, and then that I may not cause you pain, Lord, that I can live in this holiness and beautiful place. And here's a word that the Lord speaks. As we look at Israel, we look at the Euphrates River, they never took all that God gave them. And I just pray we sit here and we'll have a time of worship and you can sit and just meditate. And I know we're running, if we're running over, you got to go. God bless you. But we'll, we'll do some worship here at the end and you can just sit and go, Lord, would you bless me indeed? Expand my territory. I'm not content in the spiritual place that I am, even as great as you may be in that place. Lord, expand it because you know what? I want to give more to my spouse. I want to pour my heart. I want to pour out spiritual blessings to the one that I've committed myself to. Lord, that I can take my sons, my my daughters, and I can take them into greater glory before the king of glory. Lord, would you expand the ministry that you've given me? Maybe it's time that you go, maybe I don't even have a ministry. And God's like, I want to expand you because when I expand you and I pour you out, you'll need to call upon me and say, Lord, please help me and that I can help them because we'll sow and we'll reap. And there's a beauty that he puts before us. We'll pick up, uh, we'll fill the rest of that in. Let's read and finish. And here we are. The great earthquake, 17 through 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and loud voice came out of the temple. Who's in the temple? We studied. It's God. No one can go in. He's been brooding that it came to this. But then he says, from the throne saying, it is done. Paid in full, culmination. Same at the cross. There has to be a culminate, there has to be a wrath that is paid in full for breaking God's holy law. I'll do it on the cross for anyone who will receive it. Anyone that won't, it still has to be paid in full. And this is how it'll be paid in full. The difference is there's not the righteousness that can take man's righteous works, cannot take him before the righteous God, only through the cross. Verse 18. And there was noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was great earthquake, such as a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of her wrath. We'll deep dive that next week in chapter 17 and into 18. Verse 20. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So... The earthquake is going to flatten mountains, but if you just recalled, we said the scorching earth is going to melt all the polar caps. And so scientists have done the math, and they go, based on all the snow that we have, if all of it melts at once, the sea level, water level, would raise 200 feet. You know what that, we'd be flooded right here in Maryland. We'd have to make our way and go to church up in Delta. We'd have to get to high ground. Maryland would be underwater. New York would be underwater. New Orleans would be underwater. L.A. would be underwater. Tokyo would be underwater. And all these things. And and God's just leveling 
the whole earth, all the kingdom that you think you own. I'm just going to level it all. And then verse 21 says, And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about a weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. In Leviticus, so maybe chapter 12, uh, what's, the, what's the penalty for blaspheming God? It was stoning. So here God, he's going to stone the blaspheming, those who blaspheme him. Uh, the debate comes and says, is this uh, Leviticus Hebrew, is it a Hebrew talent? That was like 96 pounds. Or is this a Greek talent, which was around 114 pounds? Here's what I know. If you get hit by a Greek talent or a Hebrew talent, it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to be very bad. And if you consider what's going to happen, 100 pounds And I close, but it's a story. When I was in sixth grade, we could golf all day at the par three for like three bucks. Our parents loved it. Here's three bucks. We'll pick you up in eight hours. (laughs) And we loved it. We'd golf eight hours. Now, my brother didn't know golf etiquette. Golf etiquette is when you step into the tee box, only one person steps into the tee box. I step into the tee box first. I put my tee down. I put my ball on it. Not knowing that my brother, breaking golf etiquette, he's six feet behind me. He puts his ball down, and he's going to wait for me to hit. So I get up. I hit. And, of course, the tee comes out of the ground. You do what every golfer does. You know, you, you pick up your tee. So I hit. I go pick up my tee. My brother thinks I'm leaving because I hit. He doesn't realize I'm going to pick up my tee. So he puts his head down, and he drives. It was a par three. It was the longest. He drives one off my head. (laughs) Down I go. Three days in the hospital. And and I I know some of you right now go, now things are starting to make sense. (laughs) Now it's all starting to make sense. I see when sometimes it's like, what is he trying to say? (laughs) Three days in the hospital, pain, in and out of consciousness, brain swelling, everything else, nausea that goes with it, and those type of things. And it was a golf ball at 100 miles an hour. You can imagine a Greek or Hebrew talent coming from heaven what that's gonna feel like probably the most humbling part of it was that my mother then mothers they're just anyways god bless you mothers so from now on when you go golfing your father's gonna give you his hard hat from the steel mill and you're gonna wear a hard hat golf imagine being 12 years old golfing with a hard hat (laughs) humility that was where i'd rather drive the golf ball off my head again and so they give me this hard hat so mom would drop us off. i put the hard hat off, and then mom would leave. I'd do the old, you know, hat thing like, see you, mom. Have a great day. And then as soon as she got out of the corner, I'd whip the, whip the hard hat into the weeds, and I'd pick it up by, for the time that she would come. It was humiliating. But I close with that story just to tell you, that's, that, that was my life. That's what I grew up with, uh, the hard hats and, and the likes. But the Lord comes and he just brings this word for us. And all the way through it, God brings this great grace to us. Let's have the worship team come back. And if you got to go, God bless you. Got to pick your kids up or so, God bless you. Um, But you know, who is God? We, We say the same thing every time we open this how great is our God? He's perfect. He's holy. He has the ability in a word to create. He has the ability in the word to destroy and bring into victory. What does he think of me? Even through all this, even through all this, this is what I think of you. I'm not trying to fear you into a relationship with me. Let me give you my life You ravish my heart. Let me love you and let me pour myself. Let me draw you. And this is the beauty. But the Lord will definitely speak. What does he want me to do? And what can you boldly ask? This is what the Lord would speak to us as we think through all these things. As we talked about taking territory, we talked about 
the questions of heaven we talked about, all these things and the beauty of the Lord reaping and sowing, and always know what does he, what do I need to be on guard of when I leave here? Because the devil's going to come and say, did God really say that? And he'll bring the great lie. The great lie. God's keeping something from you. And as Paul would say, I'm going to forget my past failings because I know that God will still take me. And would you just live in that freedom? You're forgiven. So, Father, I bless you. And when we come and may we worship these, uh, these last uh, couple songs, we'll do two more songs, your choice. And, uh, Lord, just wash over us. Wash over your love. Wash over us with the beauty of your word and the perfection of it that... Um, You've provided us a rescue because you love us. But, Lord, there is a place that we see the world's not uh, falling apart. It's definitely coming in, all these pieces, small, coming together before our very eyes. So, Lord, what should we do uh, with what we know? And so I pray this in your name. Amen.